Good afternoon and thank you for joining us to this first plenary today, which we are organizing as the European Public Health Association in collaboration with the Regional Office for Europe of the World Health Organization. And inevitably, in a few weeks, as uh, 2020 rolls along, we're going to realize that we are already five years into Agenda 30. And we've eaten up one third of our time to implement the Sustainable Development Goals. And the pressure on the countdown is going to begin. Last year, for those of you who were with us, we also had a session on the Sustainable Development Goals. And we spoke a lot about content. Today, we're here to focus on change and implementation. And specifically through this session, we want to bust the myth that the SDGs are just focused on vague concepts that are of little relevance to health services and health systems. Because first and foremost, health systems are at the receiving end, having to deal with the growing health inequalities and the consequences of lack of investment in certain areas that fall very much outside the narrow health services area, such as housing. So we need to find a common language to build a bridge between politicians taking decisions at the political upstream determinants of health and our colleagues who are carrying the burden downstream in often underfunded, understaffed and overstressed health services. We very much believe that public health can bridge this gap using the right tools, but we have to have the right mindset and the right approach. And I'm delighted that uh, co-facilitating this session with me is Anna Chikovska, my rep, who is the program manager for public health services within WHO Europe. And it is a privilege for me once again to uh, introduce our special guest speaker, Dr. Hans Kluge, the Re Regional Director nominee, who has managed to join us briefly. We have asked him, because we know he's very focused on implementation and partnership, to tell us how we go from buzzwords to really making a difference, to share with us already at this early stage what he intends to do, and to tell us as UFA how we can support him, but also hold him to account for what he sets out to do. Hans, over to you. Thank you very much, Natasha, and good afternoon, everyone, again, after a wonderful lunch. So indeed, in fact, it was last year that we were in a uh, similar uh, plenary when we were talking about how to accelerate the achievement of the SDGs through five interconnected strategic directions. So I believe this builds upon last year's session where we will focus on the how. I myself, I'm almost obsessed by the how, and this is by the listening exercise that I did going around during my campaign of 53 countries, meeting the Minister of Health, Minister of Foreign Affairs, who had a very big request to WHO. It was not to stick only to the what, in fact, in WHO, we're very good what I call waters. So the normative function is very important, the what, but we have all to become more and more howers as well, because that's what countries are asking, how to how. That was one, one of the campaign commitments, was the WHO Pan-European Academy on Transformational Leadership. This is a network of networks, and one of the key people is with us, Professor Walter Ricciardi, who has indeed in Rome already tested this with the idea of bringing public health and healthcare leaders together, current generation and previous generation, to exchange the very practical obstacles and enablers to transformative change, which usually you do not find in the literature, these nuances. And that's the idea of this exchange platform where UFA has a capital role. I mean, you know that Walter was past president as well of public health globally and uh, European, and now in, uh, globally. So some things I came across when listening to those leaders in public health and health system is the vision. That you need to have the vision which inspires and binds us together. That it's for such a vision that early in the morning you get up from your bed. Something that you really believe in. For me, 
This is about leaving no one behind. Mm -hmm. Second, you need some champions. And you know, in my language we say, no one is prophet in their own country. It's not always a thankful job to be a champion, but we have to identify and nurture our champions. What colleagues are telling, including Professor Shoska, I always remember, is it takes blood, sweat and tears. So there is no shortcut. Sometimes people ask a shortcut. On the how and transformation, there is no shortcut. Everyone has to be ready to do his or her share of the suffering, but for the noble goal. Finally, what my father taught me, he was a chief traumatologist in Belgium. When he had a successful surgery, he was the hero of the country. But sometimes a patient can start bleeding on the table. You don't know why, and it has consequences. And you are thrown from your statue. So he told me, humor is very important. Don't take yourself so serious, but take the patient very serious. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans, for being here and opening our plenary session because I know you are very high in demand. Thank you so much. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anna Chichowska Mayrep. We are living in the era of the Sustainable Development Goals. These 17 goals are the blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. But to achieve these goals, we need a new operating system, argues our keynote speaker. As our current system has brought us to a state of organized irresponsibility. I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Otto Sharma, who asks the question, what does it take to redesign societies in ways that address the pressing challenges of our time? And how can we learn not only from the past, but also from the future as it emerges? Otto will give us a flavor of theory U, an awareness-based method for bringing profound change to our systems. But before I give the word to Otto, I would like to share with you that we at the WHO Regional Office, under leadership of Dr. Hans Kluge, have heavily borrowed from and experimented with the Theory U. In the co-creation of an international platform that we call the Coalition of Partners to strengthen public health services in the European region. This coalition, and many of you in the audience are already partners, acts as a community of practice, an incubator of ideas, and as a whole systems platform, or as Otto would call it, a social field. Dear Otto, it's time for me to hand over to you. Please do tell us more. Thank you, Anna, for the uh, introduction and uh, good afternoon. We live in a time of profound disruption. We all know that. It's a disruption that plays out in terms of digital disruption, 
plays out in terms of political disruption, of social disruption, and also environmentally. And I want uh, it's a time where on many levels you can say the following sentence is true for many systems, which is we collectively create results that no one wants. So as a collective system, we create results that maybe no one or almost no one kind of after participating members really wants. No one wants to destroy the planet. No one wants to really rip apart societies. No one wants to uh, enhance unhappiness within themselves and within others. So um, what my, uh, what my uh, question and journey is about uh, it's about kind of unpacking that problem a little bit. And that's actually a journey that took me here from Europe to the US. So I went to MIT, I went to, uh, I went to uh, uh, MIT um, some 25 years ago in order to uh, apply myself and in order to learn uh, systems thinking, how these kinds of problems can be addressed uh, from a perspective of action learning and from a perspective of systems thinking. So I want to give you a little report back here, kind of a few of the things that I learned uh, along the way. So the backdrop here uh, uh, being the, um, uh, the moment of disruption where we are in and where many of us maybe have a good understanding of where we are today, the challenges that we face, and then Already, we've, we are fading a little bit and beginning to diverge in our perspectives about the emerging future, kind of uh, what's kind of what's the next state, uh, because disruption basically means the future will be different from the past. So how the future will look like, we are a little less clear about that. But what we are least clear about is the journey from here to there. And that's uh, what I want to uh, talk about uh, a little bit. So the backdrop from you know, the method or the perspective I am taking on these problems is the, the backdrop of systems thinking, which is uh, why I went to, to MIT. And you have seen that many times, this kind of iceberg model, and that's kind of really uh, depicting the essence of systems thinking, which is a simple distinction between symptoms at the top and the, the deeper root issues beneath. And when you look at the three terms here, uh, structures, thought, and source, uh, you see in a nutshell the evolutions of systems thinking uh, over the past uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, what I'm, so it started really with, you know, focus on structures, but what we all know is kind of unless we change the mental model of people, uh, the same people, if we just tinker with structures, the same people will create the same problems in a new structure, uh, just kind of uh, enacting from their old mental models. And source really means the deeper sources of our creativity, of our identity, uh, of our attention and awareness. The three sentences that summarize awareness-based systems change are, number one, you cannot... You cannot understand a system unless you change it. The famous quote by Kurt Lewin, kind of the founder of Action Research. Number two, you cannot change a system unless you transform consciousness. If you don't like the word consciousness, just take mindsets, right? You cannot change a system unless you change the mindset based on which people in that system, the decision makers in that system, operate. So if you accept that for a moment as a hypothesis, uh, so if that was true, then what's the third question? The third question is how? You cannot transform consciousness unless you make a system see and sense itself. So what I would say in a sentence is what we are lacking today, the reason why we know everything about the SDGs and yet can't implement them, and same with climate change, is that we are lacking social technologies. We are lacking methods and tools that allow us to perform that mindset shift 
on the level of the whole, on the level of how the whole system operates, not only in small pockets. The SDGs were mentioned, and when you look at the, um, at the symptom level here, so you could say, you know, one way of summarizing the SDGs is they fall into three main buckets, right? The first ten are basically about the social divide, the disconnect between self and others. The next five are basically the environmental one, the disconnect between self and nature, right? Where all the environmental issues arising from. And then the last two, 16 and 17, you could say they deal with our inner divide, right? The disconnect between who I am today with who I could be tomorrow, which is a lot at the heart of kind of all the well-being and mental health issues, as you all know. So, disruption happens, but what is it we see in terms of response? We see two main responses in society. One is responding to disruption by more of this. Ignorance and doubt, anger and hate, fear and fanaticism. So we see what does that mean when you look at that as an operating system? What does that really mean? It's a freeze reaction. It's a survival reaction of the mind, the heart, the will. And so that's the reaction that is turning backward in order to make dot, dot, dot great again, right? and the Trump sentence in order to make America great again, the most important word in that sentence is again, because it's orienting yourself in something that no longer is, which is the past, while leaning forward, leaning into something, the emerging future, something that isn't quite there yet, requires us not to close, but to open the mind, curiosity, open the heart, empathy and compassion, and open the will, tap into our courage. So that's basically kind of the, the deeper leadership challenge that we deal with. And I think to address that on the societal level, on the level of the whole, requires us to innovate in infrastructures on three levels. One is new learning infrastructures, whole person, whole system, Number two, new democratic infrastructures, which means making participation and governance and democracy more direct, distributed, and dialogic, which we see in part happening from the local level up. And number three, new economic infrastructures that allow us to shift the economy from ego to eco, from an awareness that's mostly organized around ecosystem awareness to one that's organized around focusing on the well-being of all and the well-being of the whole. So that's like, I would say, the bigger picture. That's our challenge, right, that we, uh, we try to address when we move towards realization of the, um, of the SDGs. So, what does that mean when I take the first one, building new learning and leadership infrastructures? This is kind of one, my, one, you know, my single slide that is summarizing my view of the two, the, the two main things that I see going on in the field of learning and leadership, which is, in a word, broadening towards, uh, you know, and deepening. So deepening means whole person approach, and broadening means whole system. So whole uh, person approach means from technical learning, head-centric, learning by listening, to reflective learning, learning by doing, head and hand, to transformational learning, head, heart and hand. So that's the deepening of the learning cycle. And the other axis is the broadening from the individual to the team, to the organization, to the ecosystem. Today, when you look at our whole, all societal institutions, Where's the main focus? It's on the bottom left. 
That's where all the resources go. We train individuals. We train, so we put skills onto individuals and are surprised that systems are not changing. So what's missing is, what's the blind spot? It's in the top right corner. That's where the resources needed to go. Where we create transformational learning environments, not only on the level of teams and organizations, but on the level of the whole ecosystem, by which I mean the constellation of partners and players that you need to bring together to change the system. How? How does that work? Since I have been practicing for 20 years, running experiments on this, two, three things that we learned. One is, you need a process for that. To, you, know, you need to put people on a journey from observe, observe, accessing your deeper source of knowing, to prototyping. Two, you need for this process to work, to engage in inner leadership work, which means opening the mind, opening the heart, opening the will. What I mean with opening the mind is seeing reality with fresh eyes. Opening the heart means seeing your problem as a decision maker through the eyes of your stakeholder. And open, heart, open will means letting go and letting come. And lastly, why is that so difficult? Because the moment we put, put ourselves on that journey, we meet, as an American, I would say, three enemies. As a European, I would say, we meet three inner sources of resistance, which are <laughs> the voice of judgment, the voice of cynicism, and the voice of fear. So that's the territory that we are dealing with as leaders. What does that look like in practice? Well, you know, it's a multi-stakeholder process. You have been running many yourself. We don't have time to go into detail here. But let me just say one thing. In addition to practical outcomes, in this case, in a healthcare uh, 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 initiative, uh, the, more, the most important thing that happens is a mindset shift from seeing the system as something out there towards seeing the system, including yourself, seeing how you contribute to the making of the system. As long as you see the system out there, it's all the idiots around me that are the problem. And it's only when I begin to shift to that mindset that we begin to have a meaningful conversation, any kind of change initiative. So I started with the moment of disruption we are living in. And I basically said that what we need to do is we need to build these enabling these new learning infrastructures on the level of whole systems, not only in small pockets, not only in teams. And what I want to end with is to show you how these shifts can be observed in any sector and system in society today. So the model, kind of how do you apply systems thinking to our, you know, our sectors, you can use the smartphone, right? And what are we use from the smartphone? It's once in a while we update the operating system. It's the same here, right? When stuff is no longer working, we update the operating system. It just takes more work. The first level, when we look at learning and health, 1.0 is input and authority-centric. Teacher or doctor-centric learning or medicine. 2.0, the mainstream today, is output and efficiency-centric. So evidence-based medicine or teaching for testing a.k.a. bulimia learning, right? Fast in, fast out, which means the absence of real learning, which brings us to 3.0, user and outcome-centric. Now we have, you know, learner-centric or student-centric architectures of learning and patient-centric architectures of healthcare delivery. That's the good hospital, the good healthcare system, the good school. But in the future, I think we will yet move beyond that where we move from curative towards you know, the social determinants of health, towards moving from you know, curative measures towards strengthening the sources of health and well-being, and move from kind of traditional learning modes to activating the deep learning cycle. In agriculture, we see the same thing from industrial to organic to food as medium for healing planet and people. In 
corporate so, so, uh, uh, sustainability, we see the same of efficiency to business innovation to mission-driven enterprises. The same in finance from impact investing to uh, really um, uh, funding kind of uh, systems transformation. And it's all held together in an evolution of governance from the visible and invisible hand, uh, right, the government and the market, and organized interest groups through lobbying to a fourth coordination and governance mechanism that I call awareness-based collective action. And that means that the key stakeholders come together, apply systems thinking onto the problem, look at the issue from all the different angles, and then identify and address the deeper root issues through practical experiments. To do that, right, to do the planetary healing and the profound societal change and renewal, we need new enabling infrastructures. I think that's what we are together here for. And that's something that I believe you all are engaged in. Many of the cases that we will hear are great examples thereof. And you know, from MIT with the U Lab and kind of with uh, 150,000 participants in 1,100 hubs, it's another way of kind of turning these, these changes towards 4.0 into a movement that is not only coming out of the institutions, but it's also coming and being activated bottom up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Otto. And I think that uh, the session has really started off on the right note also, because let us face it, we come here these three days to learn and I think the message is not only to learn in the traditional way, but also to open our heart and open our will as a public health community to learning about how we can do things differently. And in order now to reflect a little bit on this uh, keynote and provide some practical stories, we have with us a very high profile panel, Miklos Soska, Paula Vassallo and Ricardo Baptista later. And uh, we will have from their ends um, uh, stories about how to actually introduce change and make a difference for the greater good in terms of public health and well-being. Um, Anna will uh, give you some instructions now on how you as an audience can also interact with us. Thank you. I'm just checking whether we have been able to upload Mentimeter. We have. Thank you very much. That's real teamwork. So, as we will hear our speakers uh, reflect on their experiences, we want to activate your reflection as well. So, some of you or most of you have already worked with Mentimeter. Please use your phone, go to www www.mentimeter.com, use the code that you see on the slide and you can comment as many times as you wish to uh, and everything is anonymous whether you like it or not. If you want to expressly say who you are, please add your name and we will during the uh, panel session reflect on what you are telling us. So this slide will stay on for a little while uh, so you can log in and then uh, I hand over now to um, uh, Natasha again to introduce our first panelist. Thank you, Anna. And uh, Miklos Soska graduated in medicine and surgery, has a PhD in change management, but perhaps the most interesting part of his CV is that for a period of around five years between 2010 2014, he was actually Minister um, for Health in Hungary. And I think we would like him to reflect with us, having been, so to say, on both ends, very much um, anchored in the public health and health service, where he's also head of the Semmelweis Center for Health Services Management, working very much on change. And being a politician, um, how can we really build this bridge, Miklos, in your experience? What tips will you share with us and reflections? Sorry. 
Yep, it, it is on. Yep. Thank you very much. And you know, the first experience with politicians for me was very painful because I had to recognize that they are uh, they they just com they have a gap in perception and they completely misunderstand us. And you know, whenever I come to a come to a public house or a house policy meeting, I, I hear a lot of whining and complaining about the uh, impossible politicians and the omnipotent, omnipotent fiscal decision makers who always block chain, uh, change. And you know. Uh, referring on Otto, we have to see and sense ourselves. Uh, so the first painful experience was me that I, when I recognized that they are thinking and talking in infographics. And if I, if I could represent this to you, we, you possibly heard about uh, Michael Bloomberg uh, going for the American presidency and what Trump said, I'd rather run against little Michael. I'm big, he is small. So you know, they, they have this habitual thinking and habitual translator engine that they are translating everything into infographics, and they think and talk in infographics. You know, if, you can, we, if we can translate the, uh, the message to their infographics, then we can go through. But we, we do not have to whine and complain about it. We are not understood, and we have this evidence, and people are dying, and you are not doing anything. Forget this. Try to not manipulate, but try to translate it to their thinking, just like when we did this public house product tax, it was like that. We had all the evidence, we researched, we had Wallach, the Minister of Finance by accident sent us the tax data of all the companies in Hungary producing any product that falls under um, the public house product tax. But it was basically a um, 20 minute discussion with our Prime Minister. Look, we are cornered by the medical residents, we have to raise salaries. He said in the middle of the crisis, you know that we do not have money. And I said, what if we have an idea? And he said, lay it on me. And I explained to him that if we just put a micro levy on added salt and sugar, we can collect a lot of money to raise the salaries and, of doctors and nurses. And you know, then, then he understood that, okay, those who eat more, they pay more for their house. We use that new money for raising the salaries of doctors and nurses. We are decreasing medical migration by that. And you know, that was the politi political product, political communication product for him. So this was, this story could be told in five infographics. And then they agreed. The other gap, I think I still have a couple of minutes. The other, the other two things is that, you know, that we grew out of Change Lab Central Europe. So it was a tremendous global change for us in our systems. And you know, there were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of enthusiastic reformers. And we saw them perishing like, like the soldiers perished in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the trenches of First World War. There came a new generation, there came a new generation, and they committed mistakes, they generated resistance, and they fall. So for these enthusiastic system changers and reformers, we have to build up and we have to institutionalize uh, process support through this U uh, shape, if we, if we want to uh, say so. Uh, and also the, the third one is the fiscal decision makers. They are omnipotent, and this is the last one. They are omnipotent. And you know, uh, they, you have to know the numbers, their numbers better than them. And you have to engage with them in an agile horizon scanning negotiation. But sometimes you have to be able to beat them. Uh, and um, and you, have to, you have to outsmart them. And if you sell a political product, then they understand that you can be smarter than them, so they rather negotiate, and then they come to you with agreements. So these three. Sorry if I was a little longer. Thank you very much, Miklos. Um, we're getting comments in. Um, I'm just asking the technicians to maybe also put the uh, Mentimeter results on our two screens so we can see them without craning our necks too much. But you see them. So, Miklos, I'm inviting you maybe to crane for a moment your neck with me and let's see what well we finished the talk so we can read them from the theoretical bridges to the practical bridges what's the essence there so so for me the essence is that without change experience you you have a higher probability to commit mistakes or generate resistance against your reform and change. Uh, so we have, to, uh, we have to guide these enthusiastic reformers or change, uh, system changers. We have to guide them through experience and we have to uh, 
uh, we have to let them experience. Maybe prototyping the thing uh, is, is also an issue. And you know, they, most of the time they, you know, they over-promise and under-deliver. And because they are so enthusiastic about the good things that they want to do, that they think it is a reality. So you always under-promise and over-deliver, and you build it through the pilots, you build it through the early experiences, and you, you build the change through experience. Very good. I can see systems approach is interesting, but can it develop concrete uh, and practical uh, results? I think yes, the answer is yes. Uh, Otto, uh, if you go to the website of the Presenting Institute, I think many uh, groups in the world are already producing results, not only in health, but also in the other uh, parts of our uh, societies. So my, my answer is definitely yes. And I guess there is also an invite uh, for you if you have a group and you want to use the systems approach to create change, to uh, join the social transformation lab uh, that um, Otto Sharma and his colleagues are running. And um, you can come and ask more about it a little bit later. So as the reflections are coming in, I'm going to move to Paula Vassalo, who is the president of the European Association uh, of Dental Public Health. And I'm really looking forward um, to hear what, uh, what you're going to share with us, Paula. I know a little bit because we shared the taxi together on the way here, but so it's a good story. Thank you, Anna. Um, what I'm going to start with is to say a little story about Maria. Maria is a five-year-old girl from East London. She has not been sleeping for three days, three nights. She has pain, she has sepsis coming from a toothache, one of the most common non-communicable diseases. And what does this impact? She's not attending school, she's irritable, she's anxious, and this is impacting her social well-being and her mental well-being. She cannot eat well. Basic function of speech and basic function of socialization. Many things that we do take for granted that Maria cannot do. The impact on Maria's family, the parents who are not sleeping either, who are anxious and also stressed about how to access services for Maria. The impact on the productivity of work for the parents, who, because Maria is not going to school, also have to stay at home with Maria. And think of this is simply because she has dental caries, something which is totally preventable. And yet, Maria, the impact on the health system, the financial burden for the family, and this Maria needs general anesthesia, which is one of the most common hospital reasons for children, uh, hospital admissions in the UK. Dental extractions from a five-year-old child, the risk of the general anesthesia, the waiting times to access, the pain, the suffering, the socialization that Maria is going through. Can you, can you picture the story? And when she grows up, Maria will have problems because of the risk factor, because it's due to sugar. Maria is going to likely to be obese, have diabetes, have other non-communicable diseases, simply because we need to address these commercial and social determinants of health. Now, we do have examples of good practices which do exist, and the importance where we do need to build bridges. How can we build these bridges better with the dental profession, Paula? I think first and foremost, we need to work together to address the commercial determinants of health, primarily sugar. If we take sugar, it is one of the main risk factors, the risk factor for caries, obesity, diabetes, you know, we are not doing enough, we are, not, um, we are being timid in approach, and if we don't work together and we create coalitions with all the professionals, then we cannot be, have a strong voice to actually reach the food industry. If we think of what the food industry has, they're going to have, they have 12 million euros to spend 
in 2020 on marketing in Africa from 2020, which is nearly three times the WHO budget in 2017. So what we have to really come together, all of us, to address this factor, but also rethinking of what Otto said, I think we need to, to relearn as professionals. We, we as dental professionals are also underutilized in addressing the NCDs. So in practice, we could make better use of our professions to actually address the NCDs and reach the sustainable development goals. We had a question coming up uh, on, on the Mentimeter. You spoke to me a couple of days ago about child smiling in Scotland and we're being challenged, but how can we make this implemented clearly a success story? How can we get it implemented across the whole European region? Okay, in fact, it was accepted as one of the best practices, but it's again, it can be implemented by building bridges. The success story of this best practice of child smile, which involves simply brushing of teeth in schools, and it's based on the principle of also universal proportionalism, and also on a multi-stakeholder approach. And this can only be achieved if we build the bridges with education, with our social workers, with all our nursing staff, with all teachers, and all getting them on board to work together to achieve this practice, which has seen such a big success in Scotland, where in 2005, there were 53% of these children who were carers free, so 50% had decay. And just now, the results have just come out that 80% in 2019 of these 12 year old children are now decay free simply from a simple measure of brushing daily at school and also addressing, adopting a whole population strategy with a high risk strategy with a multi sectoral approach to achieve this good practice. Thank you, Paula, for sharing that story and giving us a clear example about how we can do far more to build bridges with other professions, including some professions which sometimes don't come up immediately on our radar because I think we, we tend to think of you working mostly in the area of really downstream curative care, when in fact um, there are plenty of opportunities I think that we are missing. So thank you very much. And it's my pleasure now to introduce um, a friend and colleague, Ricardo Baptista-Lete, who is also um, involved very much in the health sector and in academia, but is a member of the Portuguese parliament and head of public health at the Cattolica University. And also he started a new and important initiative which I think is really gathering momentum, which is UNITE, which brings parliamentarians together to advocate for something which is a bit outside of their comfort zone. So on the one hand, we sometimes are wondering how to take uh, doctors, dentists, public health practitioners outside of our comfort zone. And Ricardo is trying to take politicians outside of their comfort zone to get them to reach out more into the health sector. Can you share this story with us, Ricardo? Well, uh, thank you, Natasha, and uh, good afternoon to you all. It's a true pleasure to, to be here. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to make it to beautiful Marseille because we just had elections, but I was re-elected to my third term and uh, I was able to run off, at least for today. Yeah. Congratulations. So, uh, thank you. Um, I, I, I was asked to share a bit of my story, actually, of a I have a different part of my, my history, but it'll culminate with UNITE. Uh, because throughout the last decade, I also played a role at the city level as deputy mayor and councillor yes. of a beautiful city called Cascais, which has 200,000 inhabitants, 20 kilometers from Lisbon. And the city hall has about 2,000 2, civil servants working within it. Um, so, I, after almost a decade working as a physician in infectious diseases, I was elected into parliament in 2011 at the brink of the financial crisis. Not the best time to get into politics, but a challenging time nonetheless. And throughout those years, coming to many of these conferences, discussing all of these important issues, health in all policies, the importance of ed evidence in policy making and so forth, when I took the role in 2015 as deputy mayor, I saw this executive opportunity to push for change. And so uh, there I was with all of the, these ideas and I started looking at all of the programs we had, not only 
in the health field, but also in the social field, uh, in the educational field. And I started looking, we're talking about millions of euros being sent out through city hall programs or being sent out to NGOs or other organizations that are delivering services for the city. And uh, looking at the impact assessment of those projects, it was not very clear what we were achieving. And looking at the history of the way we were building up budgets, it was clear that you know, one budget led to the next budget and led to the next, and there was no critical analysis from one year to the next. And so one of my suggestions to the team was, why don't we start to implement working with academia, ser serious impact-focused or impact-based financing for these projects. Oh, that's when I met uh, you would say enemies, I would say resistant. Uh, and, and I had to stop, honestly, because I would be out of a job very soon if I had continued down that, down that path. And so that made me stop and think with my team, what could we do different? How can we achieve the same goals in a more intelligent way? And, and we were very fortunate. This was 2015, and the UN General Assembly had just approved the Sustainable Development Goals. And so this fantastic f political framework was approved. My government had co-signed it, and we had this excuse now to have this very broad, if you want, multi-determinant approach to, to policy. So why don't we build up on that? And that's what we did. We created the Kashkaish 2030 project, which was a local adaptation at the city level of the Sustainable Development Goals. It was almost a full year adapting the 100, over 100 metrics that are within the SDGs to the local level. We created a dashboard for each of the SDGs. And just to give you an example, we needed to adapt them to the city level. So for example, talking about universal health coverage at the city level meant for us making sure that every citizen had access to a family doctor and so forth. And so we developed that. Every city councillor, when they present a proposal, they have to sign now electronically which SDGs are they pushing for with that project. And we created the position of a chief sustainability officer that analyzes that, fuels the SDG dashboard, and that serves as the starting point for the discussion of the next year's budget. So we can see where we are standing behind, who are we leaving behind, so we can reassess the way we are allocating our budget. And this is very interesting. Kashkais is one of the most advanced cities, for example, when it comes to climate change, adaptation and mitigation. But when we saw the results, it was the worst out of the 17 goals. After winning all of these amazing awards. And it doesn't mean that we're worse than the other cities in Portugal. No, we're probably the best, but we're still lagging behind. And if you don't look to the data, you don't know what's happening. And that became very clear and that was very motivational. Then that led us to think, but in more practical terms, how do we address the determinants in a way that can push for change? And so, inspired by John Snow and the cholera outbreak, thinking of geo-referencing now with modern uh, technology, how can we do this? And so we started working with different agencies, looking at data and getting it geo-referenced to the zip code level, to the neighborhood level. And we have maps now, and you can see everything from flu vaccination to, uh, since we have electronic prescription in Portugal, at the zip code level, how many pills of antidepressant and benzodiazepine drugs are being prescribed and how many are actually being bought. And you can understand where there is focus. Does that mean there's more, more, more mental health issues in one place or in another? It doesn't. Well, we don't know. But it allows us to ask the questions and to understand, is there overprescribing in this area in comparison to other, or are there real environmental or other issues being involved? Or even looking at obesity, for example. If you see pockets of obesity, you can redesign certain services or even bike lanes so that you can try to stimulate uh, the, the way that people live in, in, in within the city. And so we, we pushed for this, what we called the Kashkai uh, Smart Health Project. And then we came up with another idea, picking up or piggybacking on uh, an international movement called Fast Track Cities, and that feeds back to infectious diseases, which is focusing on ending AIDS at the city level. And what we did was we, we signed the Paris Declaration, that, because that's where it, the Fast Track Cities Declaration was signed, and we, joined, we added on it, not only HIV, but also TB, um, and we also signed, added on uh, hepatitis C and STIs. And what we did was a coalition of efforts between prison services, social services, 
health system, for both primary and hospital and others, and we were able to develop a model along with the university that is monitoring the results, pushing for early testing, pushing for prevention, and making sure that people are getting on treatment as quickly as possible, and we are now starting to, to see results. So to end, because I know my time is done, um, I have to say that I end, from my experience, it became very clear that we can all make a difference, especially in the political world. And par parliamentarians, when they try to play a role locally or at government level, they can also push because they are the ones changing laws, p changing budgets. And that's why we created UNITE, the Global Parliamentarians Network to end infectious diseases as a global health threat. You can check it online at unitenetwork.org. And we are currently in 52 countries pushing for that change. And for change to happen, we, uh, we came up with this idea that we need the pentagram for change which means that we need politicians, thank God, not only politicians, but also we need four more pillars. Civil society is critical. There is no universal health coverage without civil society. Scientific community, of course. Media, both social and mass media, and also bringing together public, private, and social sectors together. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that uh, everything can change overnight, but things can change if we have leaders that don't deliver only based on evidence and data, but that all are capable also of inspiring, and that I think is the secret to change, of getting everyone, all of the different stakeholders, to buy in, to come on board. And it may seem hard, but as Mandela would tell us, it always seems impossible until it's done. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. That was very inspirational indeed. Um, let's have a very brief look at what is coming in. I think there is one that uh, scrolled up earlier. Quick question, Ricardo. Somebody is asking, did you have issues with da data privacy with the small location data? Uh, yes, mm. we did. And uh, in certain cases based on... So the data came from ma three main sources, the Ministry of Health, of social affairs and education. And when it became very clear that data was very sensitive, I can remember, for example, data from the social services. We have this program that gives cash offering to elderly and vulnerable situations. There are not so many. So if you go to the zip code level, you almost can go down to the individual level who's getting the, the cash, uh, the, the handing, the cash handing service. And so at that case, we would widen a bit of the scope to make sure that we were protecting people's identities and that was embedded within the contracts between the city and the different sources of data. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. You've clearly connected and cultivated many social fields in the process. I think what we have heard is a lot of uh, outcomes, a lot of things that were happening, but often, as Otto said, all the processes, structures, and what we actually really do, the source where it comes from, is always hidden. So um, it's, it's good to be mindful and to learn from, from that moving forward. I'm mindful that we have started a little bit later and we are now um, two minutes over time, so I'm just going to give the word to Otto to maybe for one or two reflections before we close this session down. Otto, over to you. Well, thank you. I thought it was very uh, inspiring uh, to, uh, to, uh, to listening to uh, uh, your remarks. So, um, for example, uh, Paula, how you described, like in the Scottish example that we heard, kind of clearly kind of uh, making it work by linking the health and the educational sector as a, as a point of departure, and then in Ricardo's example, bringing together so many sectors and the three enabling conditions that, you, uh, uh, that I heard you describing is, one, if you don't look uh, at the data, you don't know uh, what's happening, right? So, Making the system see itself, which is, I say, said, is the, the gateway of applying systems thinking to, to big challenges. So the first point you describe is the data, right? You need to put the data into place. Secondly, you need a container where the key players, that's where your Pentagon comes in, where the key players, you know, have, uh, you know, a coalition. I think it was some kind of coalition where there is a direction, a purpose, and then I would, uh, so I heard you saying like the third thing is really the practice, that you do that time and again, and then that's 
becoming a learning routine, a learning practice. So I thought it was really inspiring how, in your example, you could really see how, uh, yes, in a small example, kind of the uh, moving, ac working across sectors and really the implementation of the SDGs uh, uh, can look like. And then, um, Miklos, in, in your kind of, your point then, you know, to, to ask and, you know, suggest kind of that we need institutional support structures, not only on the local, but also on a, on a national level, I think that would take that to, to, to a new level. And I, I picked up in the, uh, in the um, stream that somebody said, well, fear you on climate change, that's really dangerous and naive, and so we, have, we know all the signs. It's a good point, right? And um, so I think that would be a good example for a national level. And when you actually look at the data, what does the data tell us on climate change? Of the 80 solutions that we need to implement to turn around global warming, the top 20, the highest impact, top 20, 12 out of the 20 are related to land use and agriculture. Which has, so that's by far the biggest, right? What are we not talking about? Regenerative agriculture and land use, right? So, so there it is, that's a big mobilization challenge and that's where theory U needs to be and is being applied. So I think that's a great example that we need to unpack the complexity that's behind the big challenge that we face in a way that allows us to engage all the five corners of the Pentagon, not only on a local level, but also on a national level, so that we take it out of the hands of organized interest groups that have been, that have been successful when you look at the climate denial industry by investing half a billion dollars successfully turning around public opinion in the United States. That needs a collective effort to be responded to, and that's where we need these methods and tools to replicate what you described on a local level, on a regional, national, and global level. And with that, I'm going to say one more word that cannot pos one more sentence that cannot possibly summarize the discussion. But I'm going to say, let's shift our consciousness from the ecosystem, from the me, to the ecosystem awareness. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much Thank to you. the panel. It was a pleasure. Thank you.